Life is a messy business. I think that much we can all agree on. There are so many different experiences that we have every day, so many things that people tell us, so many news that we watch or maybe read on Facebook or on Twitter. And I wonder if only there would be a way for civilization to come up with um, a system in which we could structure all of these experiences and make them part of our identity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about storytelling today and uh, particularly about one of the oldest forms of storytelling, one of the oldest forms of public storytelling that we know, which would be theater. So I'm very lucky to have a day job that is called a professor for digital media in uh, the School of Performing Arts Ernst Busch in Berlin. And I'd like to show you what my day-to-day -day job looks like. So this is my lab. And as you can see, there are some students, some acting students actually, part of my lab. Um, and here are some more acting students who are part of my lab. Um, but what you can probably also see is that they're not really acting out Shakespeare. What they're doing is they engage with technology and they're trying to figure out how we can use all of this new digital technology to come up with new ways of performing things on stage and how we can tell stories that are relevant in this day and age. So we build robots and see what we can do with them on stage. Sometimes we build our own smart devices and see how we can use them in new forms of storytelling, maybe involving the audience. And we even do some venturing into VR technology because apparently everybody's doing that right now. So why shouldn't we do it too? And uh, sometimes when the weather is really nice, which oftentimes it's not in Berlin, um, we even try to turn our whole school into a stage that we can perform in. And then after we look at all of these technologies and we see how they work and how we can use them, we try to transfer them into theater pieces. And I'd like to show you some examples of theater pieces that we were uh, creating together with the students uh, that used a lot of these new technologies. So the first example, you might know this um, story called Moby Dick. It's about being at sea and whale hunting and being a man oftentimes. And uh, we thought it would be interesting um, for young audiences um, to change the setting of this play and not have it play actually at sea and actually hunt whales because that's not something that anybody should do nowadays. Um, but actually create a situation where four young people meet in a living room on a giant couch, as you can see. And they're playing a video game, and that video game is Moby Dick. And we're showing this video game on stage, and we use large-scale 3D projections using video game graphics. And all of the characters that they're playing are actually puppets that have been designed specifically to look a little bit like video game characters. In this other example, we were working together with the Berlin Concert Hall, and we were given the task to bring to life an opera by Shostakovich, that had been lost during the Second World War. Um, this was part of a short animated movie that he was collaborating uh, with other people back in the Soviet Union. And only a part of that movie was still available. And so our task was to recreate the rest of the movie live on stage. And so we used a whole bunch of digital technologies from cameras, but also very traditional puppetry methods like giant cutouts um, or sock puppet sensors where we would have little digital sensors in socks. And when you move the socks up and down, you can actually synchronize the opera singers when they're singing. Or sometimes we go a bit crazy. And um, then together with the students, we write our own new theater pieces. This one, for example, is using the robot that we were building. But uh, we also have students playing their own versions of robots and androids. And we're combining different types of technology, including VR technology, to tell a story about a future society and to see how uh, people react to this vision of what we have in mind of how society might develop using a lot of these technologies. So all of these are super fun experiments, but when you work with technology a lot and you work with theater a lot, at some point you come to ask yourself this very, very important question. Like, what are the stories that are actually worth telling? And are we telling the right stories when we do theater? Because there's lots of other things that people do in the evening. And there's lots of other media that get a lot more funding for what they're doing when they want to tell a story. So you get to wonder 
about what is it that makes theater special and unique? What is it that only we can do that other media can't, that the cinema can't do, that books can't do, and that video games maybe can't do? And then you start reading a couple of books about sociology and you find these very interesting things where they tell you that the way we socialize is actually through shared knowledge and through shared experiences. And then you realize that at the very bottom of theater, there's this thing that we're all together in the same room, very much like we are right now, and that we share in a common experience that we create together, actually, even though sometimes there's only some people talking, sometimes there's more people talking, but usually there should be just some people talking and a lot of people listening. And then when you take a step back and you think about what theater actually really is, um, then you notice that there's a, there's a giant powerful thing somewhere in there. And in order to illustrate that giant powerful thing, I will sadly have to tell you a joke. And the joke is not going to be funny for two reasons. The first reason, it's a math joke. And the second reason is because my cultural background does not allow me to be funny. <laughs> so the joke goes a little bit like this. So how does a mathematician catch a lion in the desert? And the answer is actually quite simple. She builds a cage and then she sits inside the cage. And then she defines the inside of the cage as the outside. Not funny. But <laughs> the mathematician didn't just catch one lion, she caught all of the lions. And she's also very safe from the lions because she built herself a little cage. They keep, she can sit inside um, and hang out and watch all of the lions all over the world be caught in whatever it is that she was defining. And the reason I like this joke is not just because I'm German, but it's also because I feel like it encapsulates what theater really is. Because in theater, we do very, very similar things. We usually build a space, and then we go inside the space, and then we pretend that what we do in this space somehow has something to do with the outside world. But we also create this space as a safe space, where we can do things that would be a little bit weird if we would do them in the outside world. Sometimes we're way too loud, we yell at each other, we hit each other, sometimes we do fencing, Sometimes there's a horse on stage, which is something that you don't necessarily see every day. So we can do all these things because we as a society have decided that this is a completely valid thing to do. That we can create spaces and everybody agrees that whatever happens on this stage is fine. And it's somehow going to show us something about the outside world. And I think we can use this, this very essence of theater, the fact that we have a space that everybody can do stuff in, and it's completely okay. And we can combine it with the idea that all of us are actually really good actors. In fact, you're all so good actors that in order to teach our students how to do acting, sometimes we tell them to just go sit in a bus and watch you perform, or go to a bar and watch you perform. So everybody is actually really good at performing certain things. Everybody knows what a police officer is supposed to do, everybody knows what a fireman is. Some of us are very good at acting out to be dads or mothers, others are very good at being very good friends. And so what actors really do is they combine a lot of these different traits and they put them into one big thing and then they learn how to be like these other people. But it's not that hard to create roles for people to inhabit and then to act out. And then the other thing that's actually really nice is that we're not just social with each other, we're also social with our objects. Now, we're very social with our objects specifically when they don't work. Who hasn't talked to their car when it broke down? Or who is not like actually really anxious when their cell phone battery is at like 5% and they're like, no. So objects have this way of making us social and they become actors by themselves and they give us the possibility to act towards these objects. And the, the objects act back and if you add other people then suddenly you notice that when you're in a conversation and 
somebody else is coming in and that one person knows the other person really well and you don't quite know them that well, then you can just take out your cell phone. You're like, no, no, it's okay. It's completely fine. You can just talk and I'll just press random buttons and notice that I have apps installed that I didn't even know I had installed. So objects can do that. They don't necessarily have to be digital media objects. But sometimes it helps because we're very used to interacting with digital media objects. So we were wondering, together with students, how could we use this knowledge and how could we create spaces in which it's not up to us to tell you stories, but in which all of us can participate and find new ways in which we might negotiate our everyday lives, in which we might come up with new ways of figuring out how societies should work. And we've tested this. And I'm going to talk a little bit about an example project that we've done for about 70 people um, that thought they would go to see a theater piece with robots. Now, robots are great because people apparently really like robots, and there's reasons people go to see robots just because. So we thought that's a very, very good idea to have robots in there. People will come, and then we can do stuff with them. And the way this worked is that we split the audience into two groups, and we told them that there are two societies. And these two societies consist of workers and politicians and people that do culture and people that do press. So just like any other society, but in a space where people can act out different ways of how they want to be a worker. And this is kind of what it looked like. This was one group of workers and they were given like welding helmets, and welding aprons. And we thought the best way of representing work would be for them to press little buttons. And every time they pressed the button once, they would generate gross domestic product, or we just called it energy because nobody really knows what gross domestic product means nowadays. And uh, this is the other group of workers. And so they're happily working away and they're generating this energy and the energy is used to move society, uh, which is represented by these uh, wonderful robots, on an imaginary landscape and move from country to country and societies always have to move forward because that's how we Europeans think that things should work. And the way that the, the workers were governed was by uh, politicians. And so politicians were in a separate space, in a large tent, and they had all of these amazing interfaces. They had like television screens that were showing them the current number of energy that the country was having. They were showing them the current amount of work that people were doing. And they could decide how long people would have to work, and how long they would have free time, how much energy they would use to move society forward, and how much ener energy they would use to do press conferences and tell the workers to keep on working and be motivated. And then, of course, when the workers have free time, they have to decide what they want to do with their time. They want to be entertained. So we had to have cultural workers. And we gave, gave them little funny costumes so they know that they can be funny. Uh, and uh, we gave them little Playmobil figurines and um, we even bought like a miniature football set. And we told them that they can do everything that they wanted. They can create theater pieces, they can create little soap operas, they can create little commentary for football matches. And the workers, when they have free time, they could go and hang out with the cultural people and see what the cultural people had produced for them. Or they could go to a bar and have a drink. So we also had a bar. And then finally there was the press. And the press was moving around and talking to people, doing interviews, taking photographs, and just making sure that they know whatever was going on. And there were a bunch of very, very interesting things that were happening during that one very specific evening. And I'd like to share some anecdotes with you of what was going on. The first thing that happened, and this was not planned, so we, we literally just did this, and then we were thinking of hoping that something interesting would come out of it. And actually, quite a few interesting things would come out of it. The first thing was that people were unionizing. Like after about 10 minutes, each of the groups were forming worker unions. They were like, we have to speak with a common voice, and we have to go to the politicians and demand more money and more free time. And after about 35 minutes, after that kind of didn't work out the way that they wanted, they were doing a revolution. 
So they would walk into the tent and kick out the politicians and be like, hey, this is our country or whatever, and uh, we really want things to run differently. And then all the politicians left, and they sat there with all the monitors and all the weird interfaces that we've created, and they were like, wait a minute, we don't know how this works. So they went back out and get some of the old politicians to come back in, and then they would ask them, you have to tell me now, how does this society thing work? Because I'm just a worker, I really don't know. And another really, really funny thing happened, and that is one of the workers had some computer equipment with them. And so he took out of his bag, like a laptop and some electronics. This was at a festival, so there were people that had some electronics with them. And he would start fiddling with this electronics until at some point he would have an automatic worker created. And again, this was not something that we had on our radar. Uh, so he would go around to the other workers and he'd be like, hey, look, I can automate your work. You don't have to work anymore at all, ever, in your life. And would you give me some money and then we can just share, you know, with, sh share this automatic worker with all of us. And most of the workers said that, no, they really don't want to not have work anymore because then what are they going to do with their lives? Like, just go to the cultural people? They don't like what they're doing. The cultural people actually were very frustrated because everybody just wanted to go to a bar and nobody wanted to go see high culture. It's a whole different story. Um, so that was very interesting because suddenly we had all of these different discussions and actually the, the discussions lasted for hours afterwards um, when we would go out for beer and talk to people because we also didn't know all of the things that were happening because it wasn't a scripted story. It was all of these different people performing specific roles and there were all of these small stories happening in between that were super interesting for us to hear. And so I do believe that first of all, it's not very hard to create these situations because we can all do it. We can all just negotiate and make sure that there are spaces in our lives where we can behave whichever way we want and try to come up with new ways of dealing with each other. And the other thing that I find quite interesting is that sometimes you need technology to get people to be playful again. But really, technology is just the stake that you throw over the fence to distract the dog if you want to rob the house. Thank you very much.